Every movie director is a thief. Whether it's Darren Aronofsky stealing from anime, Pixar from Spielberg, or Peter Jackson from The Wizard of Oz, one thing is true. Filmmakers were born to steal. Understanding how this works is a journey into the genealogy of storytelling, one that reveals something about how true creativity works and, in the case of today's movies, helps us answer a single question. Who is the biggest thief in cinema? From the very first days of cinema, its creators were thieves. Despite the endless possibilities afforded to them by the new format, directors like the Lumiere brothers and George Méliès copied the staging of magic shows and plays. This, coupled with the gigantically heavy early cameras and lack of modern grip gear like dollies and steadicams, is the reason why so many early films looked like enlarged shoebox dioramas. In every subsequent phase of cinema, directors built on the foundations laid before them. Because true originality, creating something entirely new, is impossible. Anyone who's ever made a movie, wrote a book, painted a painting, or built a startup is likely to have discovered this for themselves. We generally start with an idea, then in research and building it out, learn just how often similar work has been done before. Everything our species invents has an antecedent. The telephone had the telegraph, electricity had lightning, the car had the carriage, and every movie, no matter how apparently creative, has the millions of films, folk tales, songs, books, and paintings which have come before. The great filmmakers know this. As John Logan puts it, Your responsibility is to know where you belong in the continuum of your art, and that means from the beginning of your art. From there, it's a simple question of how one appropriates the works available to them. Sometimes, whole stories stories are stolen. You can map the plot of The Lion King onto Shakespeare and get Hamlet, or you can do the same with She's the Man and get Twelfth Night. You'd find that Gladiator, which just so happens to be rewritten by John Logan, is in many ways a remake of Spartacus. War for the Planet of the Apes is basically the story of Primate Moses, and you may not remember The Brave Little Toaster, an adapted kids book about animate appliances navigating dangerous and terrifying obstacles on a search for their college-aged owner, but you may remember this one. Look, look, it's Woody and Buzz coming up there! While most people don't care for silent movies, they offer endless treats for action directors. Buster Keaton's The General, for instance, is quite possibly more ripped off than any action movie ever made. And because the source material is old, filmmakers feel no shame sharing their references. The grandfather of the action sequence is, is Buster Keaton in The General. We steal from silent cinema because it's the heart of what movies are, what separates them from plays, and what wrote the visual language we understand today. A language of not only sequences, but also individual images repeated generation to generation. You can find the letterboxed eye lighting David Lean made famous in Dr. Zhivago copied everywhere, from Bond to Inglorious Bastards to Harry Potter. In the early to mid 20th century, the monster movie grew, with filmmakers like Jack Arnold, Ray Harryhausen, Ishiro Honda, and the co-directors of King Kong giving us creature effects that set a standard for modern cinema. And because today's directors know the gold mine they're sitting on, they plunder it with the means of production at their disposal. Then they refine it, design it, and mold from it Oscars. Then there are the thieves of style. The same shoebox format, which once exhibited a medium in its early adolescence, is now famously used by directors like Wes Anderson for stylistic effect. And there are those who, on the opposite end of the spectrum, won't use a shot without some kind of Z-axis camera move. They take kinetics pioneered by filmmakers like Spielberg and turn them into whole two-hour-long dances of bombastic action. Action which contains no shortage of stolen sound. Harmless thievery is so pervasive in Hollywood that it's now accepted as a genuine problem-solving tool. Writers, instead of beating their heads against the wall for solutions to story problems, consult the literature, and directors consult iconography and those who inspire them. Stanley Kubrick, Richard Roth, Terrence Mellick, Howdy Doody, Paul Thomas Anderson. In so doing, filmmakers turn movies into a kind of collage art form. And there's nothing wrong with this when done well. Often, however, 
some movies are built with more blatant brands of thievery. When directors overuse homage, they depend on the feelings we have for older movies to carry the current one, which alienates those who don't get the reference. And when the plucked item is incongruous with the tone of the rest of the movie, like the jarringly comedic paint-off at the end of Tim Burton's Big Eyes, the thievery fills out a place, which also, in a way, highlights the beauty of good thievery. Because with good thievery, we are the beneficiaries of a crime we don't even notice, of moves made by the greatest collage artists in history, mostly directors who steal a little, and sometimes directors who steal everything. Directors like Quentin Tarantino. While Tarantino doesn't pilfer whole plots, his movies are built on traditional archetypes. There's the Japanese revenge quest in Kill Bill, Django saves the princess from the castle, Reservoir Dogs blends trust no one noir with action and a whodunit, and The Hateful Eight is a Shakespeare play. For that film, Tarantino so loved the spaghetti westerns that he hired their greatest composer. Much like the cowboy who seeks peace but is called to join a violent cause, Ennio Morricone came out of retirement for The Hateful Eight, producing, under Tarantino, a score dripping with its own suspense. Suspense, which has been Tarantino's goal from the very beginning of his career. We're just gonna sit here and bleed. <laughs> After Sergio Leone, with his quickening close-ups, brought the Mexican standoff trope fame, Tarantino, in only his second feature, plucked the device and infused it with his own brand of fun, operatic violence. And from then on, almost every Tarantino movie contains a standoff of some kind. Sometimes it's physical, but more often than not, it's verbal, with a threat of violence violence in every word. Tarantino thinks of this tension like a rubber band. And I'm just stretching it and stretching it and stretching and see how far it can stretch. As long as that rubber band can stretch, the longer the scene can hold, the more suspenseful it is. And when we think it's already past its breaking point, it snaps. And from then on, in the words of Cormac McCarthy, writer of two of the greatest westerns of all time, the violence is gentle. Now, in itself, Tarantino is a genre. Just like every other director of renown, Chris Nolan takes expensive genre and makes it temporally playful. Fincher infuses thrillers with provocative social value and Ridley Scott builds epic, textured worlds in which to contemplate mortality and purpose. Of all the brands built by the great working directors, however, the Tarantino Western is perhaps the most recognizable, but it isn't wholly original. It is a variation on all westerns which have come before it. A leaf on a grand tree which has genres for branches and roots which descend all the way to the first human stories. All the way to these cave paintings which range from 4,000 to 40,000 years old. The first westerns whose badlands bore animals and hunters on planes of destiny, drawn repeatedly, as if in movement, as if in movies. Movies that became myths of heroes, journeys home and the battle for home. Home, then folk tales and chivalric romances, Arthurian legends, Robin Hood and knights of valour and violence. Violence which travelled to the frontiers of literature in the late 18th and 19th centuries, birthing the genre of Western novels. New tools like tormatropes, phenakistoscopes, zoetropes, praxinoscopes and chronographs eventually led to silent films like The Great Train Robbery, which brought the Western genre to cinema where it peaked in the 60s. After that time, metaphors of no man's land would not be as relevant to modern life as they were to the contested American West, and art increasingly looked within the walls of the city. It wasn't until our century that filmmakers retook the reins of the Western and on it toured timeless ideas of love, greed, fear, forbidden desire, and will. And Tarantino, who finally makes his entrance after tens of thousands of years, restores the gunslinging fun. <laughs> Stealing from the past to do his thing in the present, making him one of the most successful thieves in Hollywood. 
But does that make him the greatest thief in cinema? Directors have come and gone, and there have been great ones, but none made it out alive. What survive are their works, works destined to be remixed and ripped off and plundered again and again in the name of the new. So, the greatest thief in cinema is you. Because you and I have the entire library of Alexandria at our fingertips. And not only do we have what the Tarantinos had, we also have the Tarantinos. We love making movies. And it's our responsibility to steal from them. The good, the bad, and everything in between. And by virtue of our innumerable thefts, make new work which is good. New work which gives our successes something to be inspired by. So go forth and create, and in whatever you do, whatever you make or build, don't forget to steal. And if you'd like to keep stealing from us, subscribe.